Ed Millard is on our faculty. He's faithfully taught several different classes for us. Currently, he's teaching Bible geography and New Testament church. Ed has served in a number of ways in this Ohio Valley. He preaches for the Steelton congregation and has preached there for several years. Before that, he was at the Pike congregation. Before that, he preached at the Proctor congregation while he was going to school here. And he graduated in what year? 2001, right? Graduated here in, in 2001 when he was only three years old, incidentally. <laughs> right, Ed? Something like that. He is the father. Of, he and his wife, Kim, have two children together, Hunter and Cameron. We heard Hunter give a good lesson the other morning. Hunter was the first second generation graduate of this school. We're awfully glad that Ed has accepted the assignment tonight. He'll be speaking to us from Psalm 90 on the subject, God is Eternal. So happy to be here tonight. I appreciate the, uh, the honor of being here and closing out the lectureship, 25th annual lectureship. I guess I didn't realize this was number 25, but they've all um, been important. They've all been a good representation of the School of Preaching. And those assembled here this evening um, are supporters of the school, many of you, and members of the church uh, in this area, uh, whether it's uh, the Hillview congregation here or other places. Uh, maybe you're uh, a guest from the community here, and you've come tonight to assemble with us uh, for that purpose of worshiping and uh, serving our God, certainly. West Virginia School of Preaching, if I may say a couple words about uh, our school, uh, is, a, is a delightful thing to have in this Ohio Valley. We need gospel preachers. We need men who are willing to come and to learn how to preach and learn the Bible. And many of the men who come to West Virginia School of Preaching are already filled with with talent, uh, ability, um, much much of God's Word already. And uh, in our school, we, we try to teach them the Bible. And we have some, some really, really wonderful, excellent instructors, uh, those men who taught me. Uh, when, I, when I was here, um, most of them, many of them are still teaching uh, here at uh, the school. And uh, we have just uh, such, a, such a good school, but we need men. We need students. And I know there are only so many congregations here representing tonight, but um, please send us your men. And for those who may watch this uh, online, uh, send us your men. Um, ask us about our school. Ask us about our soundness. Ask us about what we teach. Uh, we, want to, we want to tell people, and we, we, need, we need you. Uh, we need you to send men to the school, and we are so happy to train them and do our best to, to teach these, these good men, faithful men. We want faithful men. You know, that's what uh, Paul said, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses. Witnesses, commit thou also to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. We have an excellent director, uh, an excellent faculty, good elders that oversee the school, and um, an excellent congregation here. Faithful, loving, friendly congregation here, and it's just a wonderful thing. I'm so glad to be part of West Virginia School of Preaching as a graduate, as a teacher, as a father of a a young man who went to this school and got his education in the Bible and training, and I hope to support it and be a part of it for as long as uh, God allows me. Prayer is an invaluable part of the Christian life. Such an important part of the Christian life. When we approach God, we are approaching He who hears prayers. Psalm 65 and verse 2. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. The Apostle Paul went so far as to say that Christians should pray without ceasing. That's like that old dripping faucet that you have in your house. That faucet that you know you need to get fixed is dripping. Drip, drip, drip. Oh, it's irritating, but it's a perfect illustration of what Paul was saying when he said that we should pray without ceasing. The faucet isn't on 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, but there's a constant drip there of that faucet. We need to be those who are constantly engaged in and being ready 
ready because of our character and our understanding of the importance of prayer to be able to approach our God in prayer. You know, Jesus talked about the importance of the genuineness of our prayers when He said, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. You know, friends, the Bible records for us many sincere, genuine, heartfelt prayers to our God. You may recall that Hannah poured out her soul before the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 15. Paul prayed so earnestly with a total fast for three days in Acts chapter 9 and verse 11. And who could forget the most sincere, heartfelt prayer probably ever prayed when his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke 22 and verse 44. Of course, I'm thinking about Jesus. Ed, why are you saying these things about prayer tonight? I didn't know the lesson was about prayer. I thought it was about the eternal God, the eternality of God. Well, the psalm we're covering tonight, if you notice it in your Bibles, and I do encourage you to, to open your Bible to Psalm 90. I didn't bring a PowerPoint with me tonight. I have uh, Psalm 90 that I'd like for you to follow along as uh, we do study this together. And you might re recall, or you might see, you might read on the page that the Bible says a prayer of Moses is the man of God. It's probably more appropriate to call this a prayer than a psalm. It, it is a psalm. We're not disputing that. But it is in every way that I can think of a prayer. It is filled with supplication. It is filled with adoration. Uh, it is filled with confession. It is in every way a prayer. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You notice how Moses begins approaching God perhaps the way uh, we might begin in our prayer as maybe we refer to our Father in heaven. He approached God and in this prayer he is extolling God. He is uh, showing uh, his, um, his, his adoration uh, of God and in the prayer he confesses not only his sins but the sins of uh, the people Israel. And then there is supplication in the end of the psalm. You may, uh, you may have heard the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's, that's a pretty good way to teach children and teach others about prayer. These are parts of prayer. Well, tonight as we study this psalm together, and we're going to read all of it, we're going to look at all of it to the best of our ability tonight, we're going to notice at least three of those. We're going to notice adoration, confession, and supplication. Those seem to be the order that Moses uh, prays this, this prayer. Let's start with verses 1 and 2. I know I've quoted them, but let me, let me read them with you out of my Bible. Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever You had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. Now as we read this, as we study this together, I, I want us to remember that word adoration. When we're thinking about adoration, we're thinking about that one that we adore, that we love, that we cherish, that we are praising, that we are lifting up. We've done it so well in song tonight, and I, I appreciate the good song selection that we've been led in tonight. And we have sung together these wonderful songs praising our awesome God. Well, Moses did that as well. The four things that I'm going to mention about adoration is, number one, His name. Number two, we're going to notice that He is a generational home. And that's the only way I can put it because He said, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Number three, that He is the Creator. And then number four, He is the Eternal One, the Eternal God. And that's the title of our lesson tonight, that God is eternal. Let's think together first about His name. There are at least four mentioned in the text. There are at least four here in the text of God. The first one is Lord that comes to us from the word Adonai. Now you might notice in your Bible 
And I'm careful about this when I'm reading in my Bible that when I see the very first word that is Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the translators did that for us typically, normally, almost without exception, to tell us that this is the covenant name of God, which is Yahweh. And it is translated as Lord in our Bibles, but Lord here, though it's in all caps, and I'm not trying to shake anyone's confidence in that, maybe you have that knowledge as well, but Lord here is actually the word Adonai, which is the typical word for Lord, and this word, just to give a definition of Adonai, as Moses approaches Adonai in prayer. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. Adonai means master or Lord. It's translated as owner. And so as Moses approaches the Lord, as he approaches God, he says, you are my master, our master, uh, our Lord. You are our owner. In fact, you're the owner of, of all. And so the Lord, Adonai, is master, Lord. He is owner of all. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17 Moses would also write for the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty and awesome who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe and so as he approaches God in this prayer he is approaching our owner, our master, our Lord Adonai but he goes on also to use the word Yahweh and that's going to be the best way that I can pronounce it. It's verse 13 of, of the psalm. Return, O Lord. And, and you, might, you might notice it's all caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. In this case, in this place, it is Yahweh. And, and again, I'm going to try to give some background of this. Yahweh means He who is. And it is that name of God. He is in that present tense. I am who I am. He told Moses in Exodus Exodus 3 and verse 14. You know, the Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are, are safe. Now, um, this name of God, this is the covenant name of God. It is uh, spelled, if we put it in English letters, Y-H-W-H. You've heard this. I'm sure you've heard this. Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce that? How do you pronounce Y-H-W-H? It's very difficult for us to pronounce. In fact, I don't know if anyone knows exactly how to pronounce it. It's called by scholars the Tetragrammaton. Well, what has happened with these words and in our translations is that the, the uh, vowels from uh, Adonai have been added to the consonants here and they have given us this word which is Yahweh or sometimes it is Yehovah or Jehovah. I prefer saying Yahweh uh, to, to Jehovah and that's certainly my, my preference to say Yahweh. But I know this and I don't say this lightly and I'm not saying this lightly as I'm talking about God tonight, as I'm talking about Adonai, as I'm talking about Yahweh, as I'm reading and thinking about Moses, God, who is my God, by the way. As, I, as I'm thinking about Him, I never want to in any way speak lightly of or disrespectful of God. And for those people, many of whom who use God's name in vain or use the name of Christ in vain, uh, is a serious matter. It's a very serious matter indeed. The ancient scribes who, my understanding is, um, feared blasphemy and they feared feared mispronouncing God's name and so they stopped pronouncing it. And they started saying Adonai. When they came to that Y-H-W-H, -H, that tetragrammaton, when they came to it in the original language and they, they would stop pronouncing it and they would say Adonai. They would pronounce it as Lord and my understanding is at least uh, I've read that um, many of them forgot exactly how to pronounce that name. The scribes, when they would write, this is interesting and I don't have... I don't I don't have uh, documentation for this. I got it in Robert Milligan, either Scheme of Redemption or Reason Revelation. I looked for it for about an hour today and I couldn't find it. I underlined in my books, but I couldn't find it. Uh, but I do believe it's in one of those books. He said when the scribes, the ancient scribes, were, were, were copying the Scripture and when they came to that name, the name of God, they would pause. They would take their pen and they would wash their pen. I, we're talking about a, a quill and ink. They would wash their pen to make sure it was clean before they would even write the 
name of God on paper. What, what reverence they had, what awe they had, what respect they had of, of Yahweh as they approached uh, Him. In the next place, he uses the word God, but, but it's two separate Hebrew words. It is El, and it is also Elohim. Uh, chapter 90 here, 90 in verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It's El, just E-L in our English. El means mighty and powerful one. God is the mighty and the powerful one. The last one is in verse 17 when he says, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. God there is Elohim, which is the most often used name for God in the Old Testament. It's the first one used of God in the Bible. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It has that L on, at the beginning of it, which is that mighty one, that all-powerful one. But it also has the second part that means to swear or to make a covenant. The name conveys the idea of strength and creative um, governing and covenant-making power. He is Elohim. And so Moses' prayer begins with adoration in the name of God when he approaches uh, the Lord Adonai, who is my Lord and my Master and my owner, Yahweh. He is He who is God the Mighty One. Not just the Mighty One, but God the Governing One. God the One who uh, makes covenants. Moses' prayer was not filled with irreverent titles for God that make us think of more of man than God. Dear Daddy, the man upstairs, phrases like this will not do for he who lives forever. Phrases like this will not do for he who is from everlasting to everlasting, who is the mighty, the all-powerful, the ancient of days. I shudder to think that if I approach God in that way, I shudder to think what God must think. When our Lord Himself taught us to pray, and He said, when you pray, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let's hallow His name as we approach Him in prayer. Secondly, in this adoration section of the prayer, we see that God is a generational home. You might have a generational home. You might have a home place. And it means something to you. And maybe the house isn't there anymore. Maybe the property's there. But it means something to you. And it means something to your family. Maybe you grew up there. Maybe your mother and father, uh, one of them grew up there. Uh, grandparents had this place. But it's a generational, maybe it's a generational home where you live or it's just a location. Well, he says, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. All generations. Number one, think of that dwelling place. The context of this prayer must be in the wilderness wanderings. I didn't say this in the beginning of the psalm I intended to, and I just had forgotten to do it. This psalm probably predates the psalms of David by about 400 years. If we put Moses in the wilderness, it's where he most, almost certainly had to have written it. Probably near the end of the 40 years wandering. And you might say, well, preacher, that's, that's, that's okay, but that's not real important to me. It's going to be important. It's going to be important because as Moses starts to pray with supplication to God, he's asking for things that make more sense in light of the fact that this people and he has been wandering in the wilderness for, for these 40 years. But while they were wandering in the wilderness, Moses still recognized that God is a home. He is a fixed home. Alexander said this, a home, a fixed or a settled dwelling, even while they wandered in the desert... One man said, to, to what does the heart cling more lovingly, trustfully, restfully than to our home? I don't want to put too much stock in this, but you feel comfortable in your house, don't you? Don't you feel comfortable at home? You probably do. That's where you go and, and you feel like you can be yourself. You feel like I can kick off my shoes. I can relax. I can get a cup of coffee or tea or spend time with my family. I can get up in the morning and I feel at ease and I can walk in my, my, my own home. Uh, you know, thinking about the home you may live in now, you might have feelings from when you were a kid and, and maybe you go off to college and you're in a dorm there and that's kind of your home now. You live there at least part time and then when you go back home and you know you bring those dirty clothes and things with you when you come back. I have a daughter in college, if you don't know. Uh, you, 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 they bring, you bring those dirty clothes back or whatever, and you just relax and you feel so at ease. Why? You're home. You're home. You're where you feel comfortable. Well, Moses said, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. 
Ever since Abraham and Sarah left Ur of the Chaldees, and they traveled up Mesopotamia to Haran, and then down into Canaan, and down into Egypt, and all over uh, the southern part of, uh, of Palestine, uh, ever since that, God's people had been moving. They had been moving. You have Abraham, you have Isaac, and you have Jacob. They were shepherds. They were Bedouins. Jacob, with his sons, they, were, they went down into Egypt, and, and they weren't really welcome there. All they were given Goshen for a period of time. There arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and they were forced into slavery. They came out and crossed the Red Sea and went into the Sinai Peninsula, and there, after their sin, they wandered for those 40 years. And now Moses says, you are our dwelling place. They were living in tents. They were in the wilderness, but you're our dwelling place. But he says this, and I love this, in all generations. Abraham had long been gone, but the God of Abraham is the God of Moses. And the God of Moses is my God. And the God of Moses is your God. If, if He's your God, if you've named Him, if you've obeyed Him, if you are serving Him, if you are abiding in Him. And so when Moses prays, Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. That's going back and even today. He is still our dwelling place today. In the next place, He is the Creator. He is the Creator. Before the mountains were brought forth, or notice this, or ever You had formed the earth and the world. And so He is our Creator. You formed the earth and the world. Remember the passage I read in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Before the mountains were created, you created these things. He created them, what um, philosophers and apologists say, ex nihilo, um, Latin phrase meaning out of nothing. You, you created these things out of, out of nothing, which shows the omnipotence of God. You see how, how uh, this adoration with which Moses approaches God? God, you are our creator. You are the all-powerful one. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Every house was built by some man, but he who built all things is God. I, I uh, appreciate the craftsmanship that went into this pulpit. I appreciate it. It's here. It's nice. Someone made it. But they didn't make the materials. They didn't make those. They secured those somewhere. This building, as, as nice and as fine as it might be, those ones who were building it, they didn't create the materials on site. They secured the materials somewhere else. Everything that you build, everything that I build, uh, we secure materials. But God created all things. He spoke them into existence. One man said this. I love this, this quote. Who that looks upward at the midnight sky and with an eye of reason, beholding its rolling wonders... Who can forbear inquiring of what were their mighty orbs formed? Amazing to relate. They were produced without materials. They sprung from emptiness itself. The stately fabric of the universe, uh, of universal nature, emerged out of nothing. What instruments were used by the supreme architect to fashion the parts with such exquisite niceness and to give so beautiful of a polish to the whole? How was it all connected into one finely proportioned and nobly finished structure? Structure. A bare fiat accomplished all. Let them be, said God. He added no more. And at once the marvelous edifice arose, adorned with every beauty, displaying innumerable perfections and declaring amidst enraptured seraphs its great creator's praise. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and the host of them um, by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 150 and verse 1. You see, Moses is approaching the omnipotent, the all-powerful God, but also so let me move quickly. He is the eternal one. He is the eternal God. He, he goes on to say in this passage, and, and this is really the, the title that was chosen for this lesson tonight, uh, that God is eternal. Notice what he says, before the mountains were brought forth, before you brought them forth, before you caused them to be born, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The mountains represent in Scripture the oldest parts of the earth. Did God create those first? Well, it doesn't seem so, but, but for some reason, uh, writers of Scripture set them forth uh, as being ancient or even everlasting. Maybe because of their vastness and they seem like uh, they're going to be there from generation to generation to generation. The mountains are still there. They're still present. And so in Deuteronomy 33 in verse 15, he calls them both everlasting. 
everlasting and ancient. Well, what came before the ancient mountains? What came before the everlasting mountains? He who created them. He who created them came before. He is from everlasting to everlasting. Now sometimes the Holy Spirit sees fit to explain something to us in, in phrases, in terms, in ways that we can understand. Sometimes God's spoken of as if He were a man, as if He can hear, I mean, incline your ear, O God, unto me, etc. Well, the Holy Spirit here, it seems, broke eternity in two. Though eternity is not broken in two. He says, from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Almost as if He's saying, the, the eternal time, the everlasting time prior to creation, prior to you creating these mountains, and that everlasting time that will go on after the destruction of this earth and the destruction of the mountains from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. He, he, he never had a beginning. He will never have an ending. He is called the Ancient of Days. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. He is the Ancient of Days because He is the Eternal One. The Bible overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly testifies of, of this truth, that He is eternal. In Isaiah 40 and verse 28, He is the everlasting God. In Isaiah 57 and verse 15, He is the one who inhabits eternity. Psalm 102, and I don't believe we covered this psalm this week. I, I don't think. Probably this will be in the, mess, the Messianic section. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. That's the passage dealing with the eternality of, of deity. But when I turn over to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 quotes that psalm, quotes that passage that I'm quoting here tonight. But I'm going to go up and grab a couple other verses and show you that, that this psalm, talking about the everlasting God, that His years will never fail, this psalm actually is applied by the writer of Hebrews, whom I believe to be Paul, um, to Christ. To Christ. And if you go back to verse 8... He says, but to the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, notice there He's also called God, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, Your God, has anointed You with the oil of gladness more than Your companions. And You, Lord, and capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, You, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's speaking of the Word, the second person in the Godhead. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. He's speaking there of Christ. And so that same terminology that's used um, of God here in the Old Testament and in Psalm 90 where he says that from everlasting to everlasting you are God. The same can be said of, of Jesus, the second person in the Godhead. And there's so many other great passages and I, I can't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want you to understand this and I want us to understand this, that deity is eternal. The Father, the Word, who we know now as the Christ and the Holy Spirit and I'll read a passage to that end in just a moment. In John chapter 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so the Word was in the beginning. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And so we find there that creative power, that omnipotent power was present in, um, in the Word, in the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Us. He said in John 8 and verse 58, Before Abraham was, I am, using that name of God that we see there in the Old Testament. Also, Hebrews 9 and verse 14 says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He is the eternal Spirit, speaking there of the Holy Spirit. And so God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are eternal, never had a beginning, and will never have an end. This is hard for me to wrap my mind around, but let me give you a quote, and I'm going to try to do my best to explain it. 
God only is immortal. He only is so by a necessity of nature. It's, it's necessary for God to be eternal. It's necessary for God to exist. God is, in fact, a necessary being. I'm not. Uh, I could exist or not exist. I'm not a necessary being. In fact, uh, I'm a contingent being. I'm contingent upon my mother and my father brought me here. Um, I remain. I, I breathe oxygen. I, I eat. I, I drink, etc. And ultimately, I rely upon God uh, for my life, for my existence. That was me, but let me get back to the quote. Angels, souls, and bodies too after the resurrection shall be immortal. It is true that angels will exist forever. That souls will exist forever, whether they're in heaven or whether they're in hell. Bodies will exist forever. That is eternal bodies, spiritual bodies. Paul called them spiritual bodies in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And in other places uh, in that great chapter, they will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so these bodies will be changed. We, we will have an eternal body that is suited for, for eternity. But, but the writer here, which is Charnock, um, says angels, souls, and bodies after the resurrection will be immortal, not by nature, but but by grant. There's nothing in your body or in your soul or in the spirits, angels, there's nothing inherent in them by nature that says they should be immortal, that they should live on, that they should continue on. How is it then that our bodies will be immortal? How is it then that our souls will live on? How is it that the angels who are created beings will live on throughout um, eternity as, as it is, if we can use that exact word in, in that way? How is that? By grant. We will be granted granted immortality. We will be granted that from, from God. And he goes on to say, they are subject, speaking of our bodies after the resurrection, our souls, they are subject to return to nothing. If that word that raised them from nothing should speak them into nothing again. I hope you don't misunderstand this. this is a, I think this is a very deep thought, a very deep quote. God spoke everything into existence. There was nothing and God spoke. Um, scientists talk about a singularity. And, and a lot of people talk about a big bang, uh, a singularity. There, it was this beginning point, and, and things went out like like this, and, and are still still going out. You know, scientists don't believe many many of which um, believe that just happened, uh, etc. But but there was a singularity, and, and I'm not arguing for um, theistic evolution. There was a singularity. There was nothing, and God spoke, and it all came into existence. Well, the same God that spoke all things into existence is that God who grants immortality. He is granting immortality, not because uh, of some inherent uh, thing in our nature, but He grants that. And if He chose, he, he, he has said He's not going to do this, but if He chose to speak them into nothing again, why, they would be nothing again. There is nothing within us that uh, automatically grants us immortality. But God is fixed in His own being. I'm reading Charnock again. That as none gave Him life... So none can deprive him of his life or the least particle of it. It will be as durable to everlasting as it hath been possessed from everlasting. I hope you don't, don't miss this. I, I'm not a necessary being. I'm a contingent being. I only live because God willed it to be so. I'm only here because the power of God is allowing it to happen. And the immortality that I will have, whether I live eternally in heaven or eternally in hell, is by the grant of the all-powerful God. But it isn't so with Him. It isn't so with God. No one granted God His life. And because no one granted God His life, no one can take it from Him. The, the life, His life cannot be taken from Him. He is is a necessary being. It's necessary that God exists. It's necessary that He does. Uh, he cannot die. He cannot uh, cease. Now this God that we serve deserves to be praised, deserves to be honored, and that's the adoration section of, of this great psalm. I've spent so much time on that. But let's move to confession. Let's move to confession as we think about, this is verses 3 through 11. 
You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you. Notice how Moses is speaking on behalf of the nation. Our iniquities. Our our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. You know, John said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Well, Moses says here, you turn man to destruction. And I've read this so many times in funeral services. If I, if I preach a funeral for somebody who exceeded or lived to that age, I typically do 70 or 80 years or, or later, I typically read this uh, song. I've read it so many times. I'm not boasting about this. I'm just saying I've read it so many times that uh, I have it memorized, at least the first 12 verses. Um, I didn't try to memorize them. I've just read them over and over and over and over. But if you don't think about the phrases, you don't get the significance of the phrases. We're going to think about the phrases uh, tonight. The first one, you turn man to destruction. Destruction comes to us from a word that can be translated dust. In fact, uh, it reminds me of what the Bible says about Adam, for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Genesis 3 and verse 19. Alexander said the meaning of the word translated dust, and the translation that he was using must have said dust, you turn man to dust. In the first clause, uh, um, but which is properly an adjective signifying crushed, broken to pieces, ground to powder. The full sense of the whole phrase is even to the state of one completely crushed or ground to powder, even to a pulverized condition. The shortness and the fragility of human life is thus brought into the strongest contrast with the eternity of God. I hope you get that. God, you created the mountains. You brought them forth. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You are eternal and you're the God who turns man to dust. You're the God who said return um, return O children of men. Return what? Return to dust. That reminds us completely. It's a perfect parallel to Genesis 3 and verse 19 for dust you are and to dust you shall return. And he says about God a thousand years in your sight are like as yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. That's amazing for me to comprehend, to think about. And it reminds me of what Peter said in 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. Know this, that with the Lord um, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. That's not some fancy formula for understanding biblical prophecy. It's just a very simple statement uh, that's profound that God uh, is not affected by time. He, he isn't affected by time. He is the eternal one. But he gives a couple of phrases here in the text and he says, a thousand years which is longer than any man has ever lived upon this earth. Methuselah lived to be 969. And so, uh, to our knowledge, he's the oldest man, at least the oldest recorded man who ever lived on this earth. And he says, a thousand years which is longer than that recorded span, a thousand years are but as yesterday when it is past. It's like yesterday. You know, maybe the days have bled together for you a little bit. They're a little fuzzy. You know, did, did this happen on Tuesday? Did it happen on Wednesday? Um, maybe for this week, that's a lectureship week. With God, a thousand years passes and it's like yesterday. It is like yesterday to Him and like a watch in the night, which is only three hours. A watch in the night is three hours. If that is the case, and it is the case, what is 70 or 80 years to God? God who is eternal. God who isn't affected by time. And 
man sometimes starts to feel as if we in some way um, are demanding from God that He owes us something. Or we start to feel that, that we're so important to God, and, and, and I want to be careful how I say this, but, but, but you add nothing to God in your service and praise to Him. He wants your service, He wants your praise, but, but you add nothing to God, I add nothing to God. You can't take anything from God and you can't add anything to God. You remember in Psalm 50, He said, If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. And that, that is uh, certainly a fact. But some people live as if and believe as if, I think in some way, that, um, that God owes them something. That they pridefully would, would stand before God and demand something of, of God. And, and this passage reminds me that that is folly to the nth degree. To think about a, a God who is eternal, an eternal being, who a thousand years is as nothing to Him, like, like a watch in the night, like three hours, and I maybe will live seven or 80 years and God says to me return to dust thou children of men and, and to truly think about the difference between God and you or me is astounding it's something that you cannot I cannot even illustrate I think about Job and I'm just going to do this quickly because uh, I know we're not dealing with Job but you know Job sinned with his mouth he didn't do what the devil said he would do but Job said some things that were very uh, very inadvisable um, to say the least. And I think about how, how inappropriate and how audacious it is to attempt to contend with the Ancient of Days. To attempt to contend with He who created us. And I just want to read a couple verses. And it, it has to do, it, it, it really applies. Job 38, 4, I'm going to read 4 through 12. God says to him, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Uh, obviously, when He laid the foundation of the earth, He had not yet created Adam. But Job, you have such wisdom. Where were you when I created uh, the earth, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I think he's speaking there of the angels. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb, when it made the, the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. When I fix my limit for it and set bars and doors when I said this far you may come but no farther and here your proud waves must stop have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? In other words God is saying Job were you there when I created these things? The answer is no. He clearly wasn't there. Now if I just turn over to chapter 40 for just a moment start in verse 6. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you indeed in all my judgment, would you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Or can you thunder with a voice like His? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse rage, the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their, in their place. As you read this great text, he starts to bring up two uh, creatures, uh, Behemoth and Leviathan. Only his maker can come before him. Job, you can't even contend with uh, the Behemoth or the Leviathan. How are you going to contend with he who made Behemoth and Leviathan? How can I contend with an eternal God? How can I contend with the Almighty El Shaddai? How can I contend with Him? How can I contend with an eternal God? The answer is I can't. I, I cannot contend. And I need to do exactly what Moses does at the end of this prayer as we get to it in a few moments. And I need to beg for His mercy. I need to beg for His mercy. And I need to beg for His loving kindness to, to be upon me. Man's life. Let's go back to the psalm here. Psalm 90. Man's life is shown to be so brief in this text. He goes on to say, you carry them away like a flood. 
This word uh, is hard to translate into English, scholars tell us. And the word, in essence, means to be swept away as by a driving rain. You've heard, and we've had in our Ohio Valley, some floods come up, flash floods. And we've had people die in places. Um, a flood come up and so quickly and just, just take them away. It just happened so quickly. They didn't have time to prepare. They didn't have time to get up out of that flood uh, zone. Perhaps they didn't even know it was a flood zone. It came so quickly. Well, he says that's the way you're life is. Your life. Uh, you carry them away our days like a flood. Number two, they are like a sleep. You may or may not be a sound sleeper. I'm a sound sleeper. I can go to sleep and I don't even know what happened. Uh, I wake up in the morning and it's as if it never happened. Seriously, it's as if it never happened. And I, I've got an indiglow thing on my watch, you know, and I just hit that and I, because it's always dark when I wake up, I go to bed early and get up early and I look at that and I go, oh, okay, it's, you know, six o'clock or five o'clock or, or whatever. It's as if it never happened. 70 or 80 years in comparison with the eternal God, it's as if, it's as if it never happened. It's, it's like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. And so not only are our days carried away like a flood, they're swept away quickly. Not only are they like a sleep, it's, it's almost as if they never happened, but they're like grass which grows up. And it grows up and, and today it flourishes in the evening it is cut down and, and withers. Something I want to point out about this and I want to spend just a moment or two on this. He doesn't say that it grows up and, and then just naturally it decays and it dies out and it's the fall of the year and it isn't growing like it once did and, and then, you know, in the winter it's not going to grow. That's not what he says. He says it is cut down and withers. This phrase is interesting because he said that your life, my life, our lives are like grass which is cut down. Meaning there's a reason for the end of our lives. There's a reason for the brevity of our lives. There's a reason that our lives end in 70 or 80 years. What's that reason? Well, he says in the next verse, for, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Why is it uh, that um, we have a brief life? It's because God mows us down. Why does God mow us down, it's because of God's anger. But why is God angry with us? Because of our iniquities. Because of our sins. We've committed sin. We've committed iniquity. And it has aroused the anger of God. And uh, we, we need to learn to fear our God. I agree so much. I, I just so much appreciated Dan's lesson. I think it was Tuesday about the fear of God. People are not fearing God. We are not fearing Him like, like we should. The fear, uh, fear of the wrath of God. Let me read a quote from Alexander. Thus far the psalmist had insisted merely on the frailty and brevity of human life but now he proceeds further and propounds the fearful doctrine that this sorrowful mortality, mortality our lives will end, is not an accident but an infliction. The direct effect of the divine wrath. Whatever instrument, uh, instrumental agencies may be employed to kill us, our real destroyer is the anger of our maker. As man mortality is the effect of God's wrath so this wrath itself is the effect of sin and thus sin becomes the cause of death. The Bible as an eminent interpreter has well said throws the blame of death entirely upon man himself. When God slays man he puts his sins before him looks directly at them not only those which are notorious but those which are concealed from every eye but that of omniscience. The precise sense seems to be that God holds our sins in the light of His own countenance and therefore cannot fail to see them. I didn't read that plain enough for you. Let me read that here in, in this text. Uh, when he says here in this text, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. It's not just the big sins. We, we have a tendency, we, we um, compartmentalize, that's a big sin and this is a little sin. Well, sin, there are differences in sin. I, I think that's pretty evident in, in the Scriptures. There are differences in sin, but all sin will damn us. Uh, all sin will separate us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Our sins will be brought out to the, in the light of His countenance. God cannot help but, but see them. Lastly, uh, let's think about supplication. We thought about adoration. He praised His maker.
Maker, Adonai, Yahweh, El, and Elohim. We notice that, that adoration in His name and that He is that, um, that generational home, that He is our Creator who is omnipotent. He is eternal. He is from everlasting to everlasting. We've seen the confession. He's confessing, uh, confessing our sins. Our sins have brought this upon us. And then lastly, supplication. Typically, we, we would define supplication as a humble begging for, for a need, perhaps for ourselves or for someone else. It might be inter, an intercession for, for someone else. But here we see supplication in verses 12 through 17. I won't spend a lot of time on this. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O, oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let me pause to say, remember, they've been in the wilderness for these 40 years. We don't know how long, but it seems toward the end of that wandering. Make us glad according to the days and the years in which we we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of, of our hands. Moses is praying on behalf of the nation. You can see that surely. Our days, our iniquities. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. You remember when the nation rejected the wise counsel of Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, one of the twelve spies, two of the twelve spies, they come back and when the ten spies gave an evil report, they said, we can take that land. We can do it. We can take the land. They rejected that report. And they, they, they uh, because of that, God's anger was aroused against them. You, you remember this case very well. And because of that, they, they suffered in the wilderness one year for every day they were in the land. They were in the land spying it out for 40 days. And so for 40 years they would walk in that wilderness and they would die uh, over those 40 years. Well now near the end of that seemingly Moses is praying this prayer. And that's the context I think. I think that's the context. And these are the things that he asked for. He asked for compassion. Verse 13. I'm going to skip verse 12 and end with it. He asked for compassion. Verse 13. Return O Lord. How long? Have compassion on, on your servants. Servants. That's our prayer as well. Have mercy. Verse 15. Satisfy us early with, with your mercy. Uh, mercy is, is um, that really undeserved compassion from God. Joy. Uh, I use the word joy, uh, but he uses the word rejoice in verse 14. That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. You can think about the despondency that they must have had. And for that 40 years of wandering in that same wilderness over and over and over, knowing that they would never enter the promised land. Knowing they would never enter uh, Canaan and spend those 40 years wandering, you can imagine how despondent they must have been. And so now Moses prays, make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. Uh, the years in which we have seen evil. Verse 16, I think he's asking for understanding. Let your work appear to your servants. Do you ever pray for that? Do you ever pray, God, I don't really understand what, why this is happening. I don't really understand your will in this. I, I trust you, but uh, can you just, can you let me have it? Can, can you let me understand? And that seems to be what Jeremiah, over and over and over, he, he didn't really understand much of what God was doing. And he felt deceived even at times. Jeremiah did. And I, I'm not saying I felt that way or we should feel that way today, but we don't always understand. And so the prayer here is, let your work appear to your servants. And, and to me, this is, this is touching to the heart of a father and your glory to their children. It spent 40 years in the wilderness, uh, and they were dying in that wilderness. But they had children, you remember. They were the Israelites who eventually go in and take the land. It seems they were worried about their children. They were worried about them. Aren't you, aren't you worried about your children? I, I know I am. Uh, I, certainly, I certainly am. And sometimes we talk about uh, the world as it is and things as they're getting. And, and I know we just need to raise them. We're not trying to raise kids. We're trying to raise adults. You know, they're ch children now, but we're trying to raise... People say that I'm trying to raise good kids. I'm not. I'm trying to raise adults. And I want them to be good adults. And I want them to be good, faithful Christian adults. But at the same time, uh, you know that your son or your daughter is going to stand before the Almighty someday. You want them to hear those 
words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You may pray about that. Well, I think that's not exactly what Moses was saying here, but he was wanting the glory of God to be seen in the children, those children who many of, many of whom were, would be adults. We would consider them adults today. And then lastly in verse 17, beauty. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Verse 12. Verse 12. I want to end with this tonight. And don't, you know, don't think the sermon's over, but I want to end with this. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom or gain a heart of wisdom. New King James. Moses, this, to me this is the point. This is the point. There's a God who deserves to be adored, to love, cherish, serve, prayed to. He's eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He created me. Uh, he's, he's my God. I, I, I've sinned against Him. And because of that, he, He's been so angry with me. And my life is cut short. It's like grass, which, which He cut down. My life's been cut short. Um, 70 or 80 years. I may not live that long. Uh, I may live longer than that. That's, that's not a guarantee in any way. But uh, 70 or, or 80 years, perhaps, that's a short time compared with the eternal God. A thousand years is like a watch in the night. What's 70 or 80 years? It's a short period of time. And so the prayer seems to be this. God, help me to, help me to number my days. Help me to watch my time. Help me to spend the time that I have in service to you and preparing to be with you for all of eternity. I want to close with a quote from, from Alexander Campbell. And, and he, this was about time, how we use time. What, what was time given for? Why do you have time? Why do you have it? Why do you have it? I, I, I'm a watch person. Uh, I, I am, and I'm, I'm always on time. One, one man told me one day, if you're always on time, or if you're always early, you're never late. And I, I believe that. I'm always on time, and something could happen. But I'm a time person. Maybe you're a time person. But why did God give us time? Why do we have 24 hours in a day? Why do we have the time that we have? Why do we have it? Well, Campbell says this, the question still recurs, what was time given for? Time, then, is given to us to enable us to prepare for eternity, to train and discipline our spirits for the high and noble destiny which God would have us to enjoy in His presence forever. But how few seem, seem to realize this truth. Many there are who, though they wear the name of Christ, nevertheless act as if the only end for which time is given and their earthly existence prolonged were to feed and gratify the carnal desires of our nature. I answer, it was given to Him in subordination to the development of that destiny to which God designs and proposes to exalt Him for the purpose of raising Him to honor and glory forever, to fit and enable Him to honor God and enjoy Himself eternally, to prepare Him in short to enjoy God Himself. Now, I know reading that, you probably didn't get the full effect of that. It is in the lectureship book. And what Campbell is saying, and I think it's such a wonderful thought, time wasn't given to us just to fulfill our carnal desires, just so I can recreate or just because I can, so I can be entertained. No, time wasn't just, time was given to us to prepare us to be with God forever. How are we using that time? How are you using that time? Let me, let me close with an invitation. This psalm and these psalms we've studied this week have taught us, reminded us to magnify God, to extol He who lives forever, the Ancient of Days, uh, our God. But, but is, is He your God? Maybe you're living a life and you're, you're not using time like that. You're not using time like Moses prayed for. He says, teach us to number our days. How many days do you have left? You don't know. I don't know. The Lord could return imminently. He could return before I end this sentence. He certainly could. My life could be over. Your life could be over. There are people in this assembly who may not be able to be here next year. You may not be here. You may have gone on. We, we don't know how much time we have. Number our days. Did not James say in James 4 and verse 14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Uh, some translations say uh, it's a mist. And this Ohio Valley uh, seems like every morning there's fog out there on that river and up on these beautiful hills. And it's here you see it, but then it's just, it just dissipates. It just disappears. You didn't even notice it go. It's just kind of like what the Bible says where it says a uh, thousand years are like yesterday when it has passed. It's just to God, it's just, it was no time at all. It's just, just a blip. And that's the way our lives really are. Are you ready to meet God? Are you prepared to stand before God?
I hope you are. Tonight, if you're not, think about giving your life to the Lord. To do so, it takes more than just attending a lectureship, and we appreciate you being here. It takes more than just reading the Bible. You must truly give your life to the Lord. You must be converted. You must be changed. It isn't enough to go to church. You must be the church. You must be learn to be a Christian as one who belongs to Christ. Do you belong to Him? Well, He died that you could belong to Him, and He shed His blood on the cross, and that blood will wash away our sins, uh, John said, into Jesus Christ, uh, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of this earth, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins with His own blood. Do you have the blood of Christ applied to your soul? The only way for that to happen is you have to obey His Word. You have to do what He said and be baptized into His death. Paul said it this way, Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. That death, that's where He shed His blood. We have forgiveness of sins by that blood. Have you been baptized into the blood of Christ? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son? Are you willing to repent of your sins, which means to change your mind and alter your life? Make that good confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and then be buried in the waters of baptism, thereby contacting the blood of Christ, having all your past sins washed away. I've done too much. No, you haven't. You haven't done too much. Uh, God will wash away all of those sins. Forget them. Never bring them up against you uh, anymore. He will apply the blood of His Son to your soul. Write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And I'm not saying that pridefully you can stand before God. That's not true. But with all the redeemed of all generations. Remember, uh, He is a dwelling place for all generations. Abraham's God can be your God. My Savior can be your Savior, but you have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live that faithful life. Trust in the mercy and the grace of God. If we might help you tonight, if you have a need, won't you come while we stand and while we sing together?